Everybody, welcome to uh, the Silver Lake Bowl. Um, I've been uh, doing this, this salon series now for 15 years, since I first moved to Los Angeles, and it started when I lived on a 42-foot catamaran, um, which I had sailed halfway around the world. And I, and I used to do these events on my boat, and then we would go to Burton Chase Park or Marina Del Rey. You used to come. I, I think I even did one around you. And then when I moved on land, and John, of course, um, when I moved on land, uh, I wanted to continue offering that experience, um, and uh, that's why I built the amphitheater. And all, all the events pretty much are free. I do do a couple of fundraisers. Um, but everything is designed really just to raise consciousness, and to give people a shared experience, an intellectual and emotional one. Um, hugs are a big part of this event, you know, so I really hope that you all get a chance to play with my dogs and meet each other because the best asset um, in the amphitheater right now is, is each one of you. So I hope you get a chance to talk to one another. Um, so I want to recognize a couple of people before, before Steve Weiss. So Ashley Bell in the, back row, in the back row, she is a documentarian. She's done the movie um, called A Love and Bananas, uh, which, yeah, you can do that if you know about it. Um, Love and Bananas is about an elephant rescue. She went to Thailand and she participated in elephant rescue. Um, she interviewed and featured as a star this woman named Lek, who is probably Mother Teresa reborn. Um, if not better in some ways, to be honest. I mean, it's just an amazing person and an amazing character. Ashley also is one of the stars of her own film, and really it's the chemistry between the two of, the, the two of them that makes it so magical. And it's one of the most emotional documentaries I've ever seen in a beautiful way. It's not like one that you're scared to watch, like Earthlings, which I respect very much, but it's, this is a fun documentary and it's a heartfelt one and it's important. I also believe Davy, Damien Nander will be here. Um, Damien is, uh, now actually, Kelly, what's the name of Damien's organization? There you go. And what he does specifically, the, you want to say, yeah, say it louder. The International Anti-Poaching Foundation. The International Anti-Poaching Foundation. Um, and in fact, uh, so he was supposed to do an event in the amphitheater here on Friday and it was moved to a much nicer house. Um, and, it and, and it was, uh, he specifically trains women in Africa um, as anti-poachers, as hunters who hunt, the, hunt poachers. And women have been much more successful than men because to start with, the women in, this, in, in that area of Africa are, are incorruptible, and the men are. You train a man to be an anti-poacher and they start tipping off the poachers. You tra train a woman and they keep their mouth shut and they go after the poachers. So he'll be here and, and we'll, we'll get a chance to do jazz hands for him. We're down here! Um, and then I, I also just want to recognize Jim Greenbaum here because Jim is, uh, has the Greenbaum Foundation, which is one of the great, if, to me, the greatest uh, foundation that provides um, resources to animal rights issues, also human trafficking. Uh, and he's just a, a man of principle and decency and and this is his first time in my house, so I want to make sure he comes back. So everybody, that's Jim. Uh, uh, and then, and so Kelly King, who is, uh, uh, well, anyway, I, I, could, I could go to every single person, so I'll probably cut it off. Which brings us to Steve Weiss. If I could say one thing. Please. Damien Mander, last time I saw him, he took me clubbing up in Harlem uh, to the point that I was deafened. So the last time he saw me, I, I couldn't, I was completely deaf. You were completely deaf. Yes, so I, I always teach that whenever I'm, he's around, I bring earplugs in case he takes me somewhere. <laughs> I have them right in here. He's, he's yeah. quite the guy. <laughs> I'm also uh, going to, uh, I'll be teaching in Portland, and uh, I, they're playing your film a week from Thursday at the Hollywood Theater, and uh, uh, it's kind of a fundraiser for my organization, and I'll do a Q&A there. So thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And I hope you'll be doing a, we'll be broadcasting on the side of the house, or we'll be doing inside, there's a movie theater inside the house, as soon as possible. Okay. There we go. So, so Steve Weiss, so yes. I actually first met him a few months ago uh, at, uh, at Adi's house, and I was just in awe of him, uh, in, in, in large part because what I hope we'll discover tonight, which is that he started being a voice for the voiceless a long time ago and has been a tireless advocate from the legal standpoint. I also happen to be a lawyer. And when, you know, when I was in law school, there was no department of 
<laughs> animal rights. There was no animal rights <laughs> right. studies. There was no animal rights law that I knew of. Right. So, um, if you don't mind, um, help me put this dog down. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, but I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I want to ask you questions, but I also want to give you a chance to sort of start and introduce yourself any way you'd like to. Sure. Let, let me just tell you a little bit about uh, the Non-Human Rights Project, what, what our purpose is. Our, our, our purpose is to, um, you know, raise the legal status of non-human well, animals. By the way, anyway, D Damien Manor, you all now know who he is. Give him some jazz hands. There we go. All right. <laughs> Damien, I, I have my earplugs here in case you take me somewhere. So. <laughs> all we've been doing is telling stories about you so far. So, Hello, Ray. Okay, so please continue. So uh, the purpose of it is to change the legal status of non-human animals uh, from being things to being persons. And that may sound easy, uh, but it's not. Uh, and so all non-human animals, certainly in, in the United States, are legal things. And all non-human animals have been legal things since for, for about 2,000 years. Uh, so uh, there's a, the difference, the fundamental difference between being a legal thing and a legal person is that a legal thing lacks the capacity for any kind of rights. They're essentially the slaves to legal persons. Uh, they don't count. They're invisible to civil judges. And uh, uh, we can basically do whatever we want to them. So a legal thing is the chair I'm sitting on, and a legal thing is the dog sitting in, 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 in your lap. Uh, a legal person, on the other hand, is an entity uh, who has the capacity for one or a hundred or infinity number of legal rights. Uh, we, we're all persons here, except you two guys. Uh, we, we, we count. Um, our value is not instrumental to somebody else like a legal thing is, but you know, our value is intrinsic. So we're, we're valued by, by courts and legislatures uh, because we're persons really for, for who we are. And uh, one of the things that the Non-Human Rights Project tries to do, tries to do uh, is begin the process of educating judges and go through, through the lawsuits that we, we file. And we've been uh, and we've been filing them for a number of years now, um, and I'll tell you about that in a second. And uh, w what we do is try to disabuse them of the false notion that a person and a, uh, and a human being are synonyms. Many judges will think that all humans are persons, meaning they have the capacity for rights, and all persons are, are humans. And we have to take them back 180 years and show them that there were ma millions of human beings for thousands of years who were, might be slaves, who were legal things uh, on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, there are in New Zealand, for example, there are rivers who are persons. Or three months ago, the Colombian Supreme Court said that the Amazon rainforest was, was a person. Or national park might be a person. Uh, and so uh, we try to uh, begin the process of having judges across the United States. And I also work, uh, in, we, we work with 13 countries right now around the world. Uh, that uh, a non-human animal can be a legal person uh, who has the um, ability to have certain kinds of fundamental rights that will protect their fundamental interests. So uh, I came up with, I began doing this in 1985. I know he looks impossibly young. He couldn't have been a lawyer then, uh, but I was. And uh, I'd been an animal protection lawyer for five years, and I realized that there was this systemic problem that would stop me from ever being able to actually protect the fundamental interests of any non-human animal because they were indeed legal things and didn't have any kinds of rights. So whenever their interests conflicted with a human being, then a human being could do essentially whatever they wanted with the non-human animal. And so I thought that I needed, to be, I needed to begin the process of moving as many non-human animals from the, from the, the uh, category of thing to the category of person. Uh, at that time, in 1985, we would not be sitting here. Nobody would care about this. Uh, I wouldn't have been doing this. Uh, so uh, I figured uh, there was so much that had to be done. There had to be classes. There, uh, there had to be law school classes. There had to be books written. There had to be law review articles written. There had to be uh, people like me who theorized as to why a judge should actually move a non-human animal from being a, you know, a slave, a, 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 a thing to being a person. So in 1985, I, I thought that it would take uh, 30 years before of, of organizing before we'd be able to file the first lawsuits that had a reasonable chance of success and I was pessimistic it only took 28 years so <laughs> it was uh, 2013 that was the time when we were ready and we began filing our first lawsuits uh, in the state of New York on behalf of chimpanzees 
Uh, now we're filing lawsuits uh, on behalf of elephants in Connecticut, and we're now coming to Southern California. We'll be filing lawsuits on behalf of uh, likely elephants, uh, chimpanzees, and we've been you know, saying in public to SeaWorld now for some years that we're coming after you know, your orcas as well. And, uh, and we're also uh, beginning to uh, get involved in, in ordinances, in, in likely in cities and towns throughout Southern California, in which we're going to try to persuade uh, city councils or to, uh, to uh, pass ordinances that would give legal rights to certain non-human animals you know, within their cities. Um, and then we work in, you know, throughout, the, throughout the world, too. So uh, for me, in the last, uh, just in the last two months since April, uh, you know, I've been uh, working with groups in uh, you know, England, Israel, uh, Spain, you know, Hong Kong, Malaysia, uh, India, uh, and then there's, uh, I'll be in uh, Berlin in two weeks, back to England, over to Portugal, Sweden. Uh, there's a lot of people who have a lot of interest in what we're doing. So that's kind of a brief, you know, pricey of what we do. So, so I'm just curious to start with, which is, what was the road not taken? It was like, um, wait, I tell you, I'd be a patent attorney or I'll be an animal rights lawyer. Like, what were, what did you almost do instead of this? Uh, I was uh, a, a young lawyer uh, who was just just had a general practice, yeah. uh, and uh, uh, I read in 1980. I read Peter Singer's book, Animal Liberation, and he and I realized that. And I'd also come out of the civil the, the Vietnam anti-war movement, yeah. and so that I, I was, had become a lawyer because I was really interested in issues of social justice. And when I read his book and realized that uh, non-human animals were treated terribly, that I was one of the people who were involved in treating them terribly. Uh, and in, in numbers that just staggered me, you know, in the billions or tens of billions, and, and I decided that I was part of the problem. I wanted to be part of the, of the solution. And then I, I realized, as I read Peter's book and went to look at other places, that were, there were literally uh, no lawyers in the world who were representing the interest of all these non-human animals. And so I said, well, uh, then I would, I would do that. And, uh, well, I, that's I, what I, did. Would, I would love if you could just set the scene of the day that you just decided, okay, I'm going to start fighting for the rights of animals. Did, I mean, back then, because this was in the 80s? This was 1980, yeah. So, like, did you go to the stacks? Did you just say, like, where did you find your first statute that, would, might, that might be eventually, or the, the case law? Like, what was the first thing you said, okay, I'm going to start suing under this law? Like, where did you even find that? Well, first, I spent a long time trying to educate myself. So before I did anything, yeah. I read, you know, for a long time about just about animal protection, tried to understand, you know, what was going on. Because 1980, and, you know, frankly, no one cared at all about the idea of <coughs> non-human animals. You know, PETA didn't exist. Uh, uh, wow. nobody, it, nobody existed. Uh, and uh, there, weren't, there wasn't anything written about it. Um, it, it just was something that uh, no one had really, really cared about. And can we also be honest with him that probably a lot of people who were involved that were, were on the fringe or felt like they were. Well, they the were felt they, they indeed were seen to be be that right. way. So for the first year or two, I actually thought I was the only lawyer in the world who was interested. And in Thanksgiving day after Thanksgiving, 1981, I had read in one of my magazines that I had seen that uh, Joyce Tischler from uh, San Francisco. Uh, was trying to begin a national organization called Attorneys for Animal Rights, which later became the Animal Legal Defense Fund, and I later became the president of it from 1985 to 1995. And she wanted to form an organization. It had been kind of a local San Francisco, another local L.A. Right. organization. And so that's, that's what we did. And, you know, for several years, we kind of used to meet in uh, Fort Mason in San Francisco and sit around saying, this problem is, is overwhelming. You know, where... Are the po uh, where are the points of entry you know for for lawyers right and uh, so that's when we began to try certain things in my private practice as well and I quickly realized that there was that there was a systemic problem that non-human animals were things and therefore they were invisible to to the law and so we could they didn't have any rights we could never represent them uh, and uh, that was going to be a problem and that's the problem in 1985 I said this this has to stop because you know all the, the all human beings, you know, right now are legal persons, and the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that all human beings shall be persons, all individuals shall be persons. The uh, United, uh, the the uh, uh, Convention on Social and Political Rights says that all all of us will be persons, and that's because all legal history tells us that the only persons have their most fundamental interests protected 
uh, and has to be protected by rights. So I said, the only way in which we'll be able to protect the fundamental interest of any non-human animal is if we can make them persons. And that's what I decided uh, we were going to do. Okay, so th this, is, this is me thinking like, uh, not just a lawyer, but me thinking like a movie person, okay? So I'm envisioning you sitting around there, looking through the stacks and trying to find your first case that you're gonna bring, because it's not like you had a client that was gonna show up with money. There was no elephant that was gonna show up with a $10,000 retainer and say, right. help me out. Not like now where they do it all the time. Right, like they do, uh, <laughs> keeping their money in their trunk and everything. <laughs> right. But like, like I just, I envision you, what, like what was the moment you like that found that first that first cause of action or that first law that might provide some protection. Where were you and what, what did it feel like? Well, once I decided in 1985 that that was going to happen, uh, I realized I was I had no idea how it was going to happen. I just knew it was going to happen. Right. And so uh, I then took the next seven years uh, to haunt the Boston University Library, because that's where I was a lawyer, and I began to try to understand what rights are, where they came from, um, who you know? Who had them? Uh, who didn't have them? Why some humans didn't? How the abolitionist movement worked? Uh, and I, be I I literally went from like eighty-five to ninety-two, where I just read and read and tried to understand, uh, and then began to get ideas uh, about it. Began to write. Law I wrote some law review articles about it because I wanted. Once I understood it, I wanted to speak to my profession, my fellow lawyers about it, and. After a few years, I realized that you know even even my mother was not reading any any of my law review articles. So uh, I, I then decided Is I she wanted. Watching now? Just uh, like she's not watching now either. Oh, okay. uh, and so uh, uh, what happened was um, um, I thought I better try to figure out how to write trade books. So I f you know, I began to write trade books. I found a really great editor on Beacon Hill. So yeah. I you know I've written four four you know four books about it, and then began to say, look, I need to teach. I need to be able to teach about this. And so in 1985, I wrote a letter to all seven law schools in Boston saying I want to teach animal rights. And um, when they didn't answer after a year, I figured they probably weren't interested. I take that as a no. Uh, and so uh, in, in 1990, the Vermont Law School asked me to teach animal rights. And so I did. And for the next 25 summers, I, I taught at the Vermont Law School. And the real breakthrough was in 2000, I, start, I taught the first class in animal rights law at the Harvard Law School. And so... Uh, that was simultaneously with my first book coming out. And so at that time, there were still only maybe four law schools in the United States that taught a animal anything. Right. And now there's probably 140. Uh, so uh, that's one thing. I think when I began to teach at Harvard, that really that, started right? it. Yeah. So okay. then last year I taught at Stanford. and uh, Just tell me the moment, though. Give us the moment. When, when was the first time you saw a good cause of action? The, the first time I understood what the ca a cause of action, and for those of you who aren't lawyers, the cause of action is means this. Like, uh, you can't just go in and say, you know, I don't like something, I want to change it. Uh, uh, judges and lawyers, are, we, we're taught there's certain kind of boxes that you have to, you have to check off some kind of a box. So if somebody runs you down in a car, you check off the box of I was negligently run over. If, you, if someone breaches a contract, you have, you, you know, there's a breach of contract box, you know. So uh, what... I began thinking about uh, in, in one of my books, the first one called Rattling the Cage Toward Legal Rights for Animals, um, I wrote about a, a, a case called the, uh, called the Somerset case, Somerset versus Stewart, in which a judge in 1772, Lord Mansfield in, in London, uh, ruled that a slave, James, James Somerset, was free, was freed, uh, and they did it through what was called a common law writ of habeas corpus. and. So I wrote about that in, in, in my book. It was about a half a page. And then uh, I, had a, I was on a, a book tour, and part of it was just in London. I went to Westminster Abbey, and I went into Poet's Corner. And there, behind some construction that I had to push one side, there was a plaque to Granville Sharp, who was one of who's called England's first abolitionist. And then they talked about that he was instrumental in the Somerset case. And I began to think about it more. And then I thought, I better, I'm trying to understand the best causes of action. And I then wrote another book called Though the Heavens May Fall that just talked about how slavery was ended in England, human slavery. And so I said, I, you know, if human slavery can be, it can be changed to a common law writ of habeas corpus, well, non-human slavery can too. And, for, and that was the day uh, when I was standing in Westminster Abbey uh, that I decided that we would begin by using uh, what's called a common law, like writ of habeas corpus, the, the law that judges okay, we make. We have our first cinematic moment.
There, okay, so there we go. And so that was the moment. Yeah. There I am pushing it. I'm in Poet's Corner and saying, that's it. That's what I'm going to do. Eureka, he said. Indeed. Bathtub over then I, I, I ran out naked out of my bathtub down there the street stream Eureka. <laughs> so now we know the rating of the movie. Too. <laughs> PG-13. PG All right, so... Um, uh, I want an, at least an R. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and then now, so seven years of study, you, you've had your big moment, you start, you start bringing cases. Right. When do you feel like you had your first real success? Well... Um, one of the things I, that I figured in 1985 I needed to do was this was way, way beyond me, that uh, I, I was going to have to form an organization. And so in 1995, I formed a nonprofit called the Center for the Expansion of Fundamental Rights, um, which was essentially me uh, for the next you know, 12 years. Those of you who have done nonprofits can understand essentially me. Really relate. Uh, yeah. And uh, uh, in, in 2007, I decided I am so, like, so ready. I've been theorizing now for 22 years. I've been teaching all over the world. I've been writing. Uh, now let's start to, to see where the, the theories that I've come in, how the, what's going to happen when they come into, actually come into a courtroom. Right. Uh, and so uh, I began uh, trying to bring people in, and we then you know, formed, actually the, non the, the Non-Human Rights Project became a project of the Center for the Expansion of Fundamental Rights and eventually swallowed up the whole thing. So we called it the Non-Human non Rights Project. And we began to um, attract lawyers. Everybody's a volunteer, by the way, for the, um, uh, everybody was a volunteer for the first, um, like, 18 years. Uh, so uh, we be I began to, to attract folks. And now uh, Courtney Fern is here. She's, a, a pre she's our um, uh, campaigns director. Lauren Chilton's our communications director. And we have other lawyers. And we begin to, um, to plan, plan the cases. And we begin to um, uh, actually spend seven more years trying to figure out the problem of where do we actually file these lawsuits? We can file them in any English-speaking country in the world. And so we, uh, we, uh, I actually come up with a list well, of because about... Because it's common law, you can file it anywhere. It, common law is the law of, in the English speak, of English-speaking countries around the world. That the difference between a common law country and a civil law country, and the reason we stick to common law, is that in a common law country, judges can actually make law. In a civil law country, judges enforce the law that parliaments make. So the argument would be, uh, when we go in on a writ of habeas corpus, that you judge, or the judges before you, you common law judges, you're the ones who said that non-human animals were legal things in the first place, and you can then change that. As opposed, so that, that, that's what, what, what we wanted to do. So uh, we looked at like 20 English-speaking countries, we looked at all 50 states, and we had about 60 questions that I needed to be answered. So we had a massive number of people working on it. So we, so we basically had to answer about, about uh, 4,000 questions. So it took seven years. And then every, uh, every six months, we would have the, the lawyers would gather in a hotel room in Times Square and argue about what was going on, you know, where was the best place. And we ended up putting all these jurisdictions in a, in a hierarchy. Right. And we came and out popped on New York, New York State. So we decided that... Uh, that we would do it the opposite way that lawyers do. Usually people, people come in and say, I want to be your client, and you know where you're going to file. This time we decided to figure out where we wanted to file and then look for a client. And so that, then we had the next problem, which is, who's our client going to be? And uh, I had been thinking about that for the last 15 years, and I had decided that I thought the first clients would be those non-human animals in the United States who are not indigenous to the United States, uh, there were a relatively few of them, so we would not really uh, start uh, you know, pissing off enormous economic interests who were extraordinarily cognitively complex, uh, that we had an enormous amount of scientific evidence behind it. Uh, I, I, and I, I have a degree in chemistry, believe it or not, uh, so uh, I, I would spend a lot of time speaking with scientists. Uh, and so uh, that narrowed down to uh, to apes, to especially chimpanzees, to elephants, and to cetaceans, you know, orcas and whales. And so we went to New York and began to be, we found quickly there were no cetaceans there. And so we began looking at all of the elephants and, and, and we looked at the, at the gorillas and the, and the, the chimpanzees. And we, this, we picked two chimpanzees that were in a roadside zoo. They're going to be our first clients. And before we could get the lawsuit filed, both of them died. And uh, we realized that there's a r serious problem there. So we actually then 
r ransacked the state of New York and, and identified all of the chimpanzees and simultaneously brought habeas corpus cases on behalf of, of, of all of them. And one of the reasons we chose also the writ of habeas corpus was because uh, the idea, that there's no what lawyers would call res judicata. Like if you and I have a, you say I think you've breached a, con a contract, I sue you and I lose. If I sue you again, you would put up the defense of res judicata, the thing is finished. In other words, I can't keep suing you until I win. There's an exception, and that exception, thank goodness, is the writ of habeas corpus. You can, you can keep filing lawsuits. So we had a sneaking suspicion that after, since the law had of no, all non-human animals being legal things for 2,000 years, the odds of us all of a sudden coming in front of a judge and, say, and him saying, or her saying, well, you know, we, I, we see that animals, non-human animals, have been legal things for 2,000 years. I never realized that we were wrong. Of course you're right, you win. We thought that was not likely, <laughs> that, uh, that we were likely to suffer you know, a lot of defeats. And what we were then trying to do was win pieces of the cases, have the judge say, okay, you win this, but you're not going to win that. So uh, we started filing those kinds of cases, and we began um, uh, losing, but oftentimes with the judge saying, Basically, I just don't, we had one judge saying, I'm just not going to be the first judge to do this. And we understood that. And um, can, I, can I step in for a second and ask you what it was like during your first, some of your first cases? How did the judges react? I mean, was there just disdain and disgust? And, or was there like amusement? How, what was the average reaction? The, the, there was were, like um, <laughs> there were uh, yeah, there cases, go. well, it was, it was, it was a range and, and we expected that. And we expected it to follow the range of how people feel about non-human animals, like in their heart and in their soul. And uh, uh, so we had uh, many judges who would say, wow, you know, your legal work is, is, is terrific. And what can we do for you? But I'm not going to issue the writ of habeas corpus. And we had um, others who would, um, well, who were kind of in the middle. And then we had others who were basically saying, what the hell are you doing in my courtroom, you know, with this frivolous you know, sort of thing. And um, we would just say, you know, you want us to lose, okay, we lose and we're gonna go up to a higher court. Okay, we all agree we lose, up to, up to, up we go. And also a thing about habeas corpus is it's, it's called a summary writ. It's really fast. So we'd go into a New York court and we'd say, a judge and say, would you issue the writ of habeas corpus? He says, no, that's the end of the case. It's all done in 10 minutes. So we have like the, we've tied the world record, our own world record several times for the <laughs> quickest way of, you know, of losing a case. So, because um, well, we want, we want to get up to the appellate courts. Yeah, and, but now the appellate court, though, appellate law, for those of you who don't know, and you can correct me if I get it wrong, um, but appellate law is largely written. It is. You know? So you don't get to stand and you don't, unless you make it to the Supreme Court, you don't really get to stand and be your, uh, an advocate. Oh, no, 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 we, yeah. we do. Okay, we, we, we don't, we don't, we, we don't, we don't put evidence in, but what right. we do is, is, is we argue the law. And we only argue in, in the state courts. Uh, we all, we felt there's many procedural reasons, and we also felt that, you know, the United States Supreme Court was ne we're not going to win. Uh, we're we're years before, you know, we're we're years premature to the federal system, uh, and they also have we thought more favorable law, you know, in, in in the states. So New York has these all of these trial courts, which are like the Superior Court in California. So we would we and then they have four different intermediate appellate court courts and then they like you would you have like uh, the appeals or uh, appellate courts or they, it's California called or? it's called the court of appeals right and then there and then there's one high court which is called the court of appeals for b reasons which are remain unnamed the lowest courts in new york are called the supreme, the supreme courts court, right. okay so you have all these supreme courts you have these four intermediate appellate courts and then you have one court of appeals so we for various reasons ended up filing lawsuits and the lawsuits would be in different places, but in each, we filed one lawsuit in each of the four intermediate appellate courts. And then we immediately started losing for a whole slew of bizarre reasons. And we began to realize they don't want us to win, but they have no idea why they don't want us to win. And uh, so we, we just would make different sorts of arguments and they would, they would not agree with each other. Uh, and they would, they would, when one of them your arguments wouldn't agree with each other no the courts, the courts when we lost they wouldn't agree with each other so one of the and first one grounds for well the we hope the the first uh, uh intermediate appellate court ruled against us saying you're appealing you don't even have the right to appeal we said you know you're wrong with respect and uh 
then we then the, the second time we lost they said well the only being who can have a, a right is one who can actually also um, bear a duty and we said well you know that's no court in the history of the world has ever said that you know you're wrong and then the next court said uh, uh, the reason you lose you can't bring a writ of habeas corpus because uh, a writ of habeas corpus is only used to, to get somebody out of uh, detention and you're asking that the chimpanzee be moved to a sanctuary so for that reason you lose as if we had asked them to let the chimpanzee out in Times Square we would have won uh, I think not uh, and then the the fourth court we lost just which was last year where they said they just kind of got right to it you can't win because only a human being can have rights so three years 19 in 2015 yeah. we, we had appealed uh, and sought further review of some of the cases and the Court of Appeals of New York it can has discretion as to which which uh, cases it takes and they only take about three or four percent of the cases so they, they they didn't take ours so we said okay then we appealed the one in which we lost uh, where the court had said you have to be human and um, the uh, Court of Appeals uh, last month uh, then refused to take it but what occurred was this extraordinary thing which is that uh, one of the judges said that that was a mistake and this be he became in, on May 8th the first high court judge in the United States to actually give a written opinion on the merits of our case and he said by the way I ruled against you in 2015 I'm really sorry you know, I, I changed my mind essentially which yeah, was yeah. which we were very happy about that he said I see you've lost in these intermediate appellate courts by the way all of them were wrong just like you've been saying which was terrific he said having a, a, a chimpanzee uh, you know being kept in a prisoner that is a quote manifest injustice unquote he said a chimpanzee is not a thing he said a chimpanzee is likely a person that's his heart and we think that is a, a you know a major step forward and that is on top of what had happened in a, in a lower court in New York in 2015 where for the first time in, in history a judge actually did issue a writ of habeas corpus on behalf of our chimpanzee client against uh, Stony Brook University and ordered Stony Brook to come into court to say why they think they can they can detain a, ch a chimpanzee and uh, so we uh, we had a you know a, uh, a huge fight uh, there so uh, in in uh, New York we and we're still litigating in New York but we have now had the first habeas corpus in the history of the world issued there and we have had a judge now say uh, a hot, the only high court judge in the United States who's ever ruled uh, who's ever given his opinion saying basically you're right so we're definitely you know getting somewhere yeah. all right so I want to I want to ask a, another question then I want to start are you following am I being too technical or am I, you're following all the ins and outs oh okay good well, well we'll get one second so I just just want to say first of all a statement and then a question the statement is that I get the feeling and I have since I first met you and certainly tonight uh, affirms it that if we were living in a time where, I don't know, myself as a Jew or myself as uh, whatever characteristic, that if I had no rights, you'd be there fighting for me. Absolutely. And, and, I just, and, I, and I, I'm so grateful to know someone like you and to know that you're out there because you know, you're doing something of such incredible importance um, and you're standing up for, people, for entities that aren't receiving rights. And so I'm wondering, from that emotional place, what's it like knowing that during the time that you've been practicing this law, corporations have been given rights uh -huh. and be considered to be persons right. and yeah. not animals? Well, we point that out to the judges, <laughs> uh, uh, that. And, so how does it feel for you, though? I mean, is that like... It's, um, it's irritating. <laughs> it's, it's, it's maddening. Um, what you know all of us in the in the, in the non-human rights project are really fueled by this you know frankly anger about how all these no, all these non-human animals are, are 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 being treated and we you know we know and i think i think i wrote in one of my books i wrote i said in the united states 350 non-human animals are killed for every time my heart beats and i'm very cognizant of the fact that every time my heart beats you know that 330 animals are, are killed and this is you know infuriates us um, and and all we're and we're working, you know, as 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 
fast as as we can to to uh, to stop it. Uh, you know, I've done I've done a lot of reading in the history of, of of human slavery and how it was stopped, and I've certainly studied many of the abolitionists, and I understand how angry they were, they were about it. Um, but we also learn, uh, certainly the lawyers do, that um, if we that being angry actually make being overtly angry actually makes me a, a worse advocate, and that we have to kind of cordon that off, kind of like the way a doctor can't say, oh my God, blood, and keep fainting every day. Uh, they, you know, a, judge, a doctor has to say, okay, that's blood, but I have to focus on this. And we're saying, uh, that's how the law is. All these non-human animals are being enslaved. Uh, we, we have to kind of channel our anger into making calm arguments that are intense, but we have to, uh, we have to make arguments, legal arguments, in terms of what, in, in terms of, we have to talk judge. We have to make arguments that, that they recognize as being legal arguments and that, and that they can, if, they're, if they feel that we ought to win, which some of them are now, that they, they have something that they can really hang their hat on. And so we spend so, a lot so of time devising of, these arguments. And so, you kind of, so it's interesting because you, know, the le you, you have to channel things through the left brain because it has to be organized and lawyerly, but all the emotion and a lot of the creativity is in the right brain. I'm just curious if you don't mind, because this is Los Angeles, you've got a spiritual crowd. Is this, has this changed you as a person? Has it made you, uh, has, it, has it connected to a spiritual practice? Is it connected to a psychological practice of yours? I mean, how have you dealt with the frustrations and channeled it in terms of forward moving energy? I, I don't think it's changed me. I, I, I think it's probably, I think I've always been that way. Uh, or well, actually, how did you get there? Actually, how, uh, I th actually, there was something that, st that stopped me. When I was when in the 1980s, when I first began working with non-human animals, uh, for the next 10 or 20 years, the most common case I had, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm licensed to practice in Massachusetts, uh, were uh, not were dogs who had been ordered executed because they were like really bad dogs, like and mine, like right? no, I mean really yeah, bad dogs, uh, and so people would come to me uh, and their do and their dogs had been ordered killed, oh. and so the only thing that was between them and and being killed was me and yeah, I did about 150 of these cases and I only lost three of them I, only three dogs were killed and they were because frankly their owners were such jerks that um, I could the, the judges would they weren't going to give the owners another chance uh, and so uh, for example I had one one client whose dog had after being ordered in seven different cases to make sure his dog doesn't bite anybody had his dog bite somebody and so I just couldn't save that dog. And I thought it was unethical for me to suggest that the owner be euthanized instead of the dog. So, so uh, but as I began to do that, I realized that, you know, I, I, I first I started saying, I really want to know who this dog is. And then, uh, and all about them in order to represent their interests and stop them from being killed. And so then slowly over the first couple of years, I realized that I began to be haunted by, by the dogs. I couldn't sleep. I was worried and I began to realize that I was a poor advocate because of the fact I became paralyzed by, by, by the fact that if I lost the case the dog was going to be executed. And so I then relatively early on said I don't want to meet the dog. I don't want to know anything else about your dog because it's actually, I, I began to actually learn how to kind of build that, that internal wall and, uh, and I thought I would be a better advocate and I pretty much have have you know, brought that into in, into the into the work I did, and you know I've been into slaughterhouses. You know I've been into um, uh, I, I I I've seen I've seen you know really horrible things, um, and I you know sometimes I just start crying, and that's then and you know but and so in fact I'm, I may start crying now thinking about the times in which I started crying, uh, <laughs> but um, that I, I think all of us feel. You know, the, the emotions cannot paralyze us. They have to kind of catalyze us. And so, and so to that degree, we have to kind of put, put that to one side, yeah. th those feelings, and, and kind of channel that into, channel the fury into dispassionate legal argument. And um, there, was, uh, there was a Penny Baker, Hedgetus, uh, HBO film that, that premiered at Sundance, you know, about the non-human rights project. You're in it, yeah. I'm, I'm in it, and it's called Unlocking the Cage. Yeah. And uh, it, and... Um, one and oftentimes when people you know, talk to me about it, they say, 
how can you stand there and basically take the abuse of those judges and kind of calmly say, well, maybe think about it this way? And the answer is, inside, I'm really pissed off, uh, and I don't, I don't like it, but that gets me absolutely nowhere, and this is not about me. Right. You know, it, it's about them, so my job is to figure out how can I best advocate for entities who don't even know that I'm there, and, uh, and, and how, how, how do we succeed in, you know, in, in, in changing the world in really the most powerful way? You know, I, we, I think we view uh, our work as being part of, you know, the greatest social justice movement in the history of the world. And, uh, you know, how do, we, how do we do that? How do we do that? And, you know, and we, we have a responsibility to all of them. You know, and, and, and I don't think, you know, we, to this generation, to their next generation, probably to the next 20 generations until we begin to, to make sure that there's not going to be a 21st generation of, of those non-human animals who are being you know, slaughtered in that way. You know what's interesting? This, it's so interesting that you said that, that part of your practice in the past has been to defend dogs on death row. Yep. Because I don't know if you know, I don't know if we've had the conversation, but as Commissioner of Animal Services, Services for Los Angeles, I happen to be, along with my other four commissioners, the final judge and jury on ah. animal death penalty cases in Los Angeles. And I've had many attorneys come up who would take your seat in that. And with all due respect to them, they're, you know, some of them are people of great intention and, and, and even skill. Um, I have yet to see a truly passionate argument. I have yet to truly see one of these animals represented to the level that I'm sure that you would do it. And and I just, you know, I, I just think about, again, how fortunate we are that you're out there on the, on the level that you are. I mean, it's really remarkable. And I just want, hope you get feeling that support from this group here, you know, for the fact that you're there. Well, and it's just not me, you know, it's Courtney, it's Lauren, it's the other, Lauren, the, uh, the other lawyers in the, Non-human rights project. And, and uh, lots of volunteers. Yeah. yeah, I you know I work with extraordinary, extraordinary people. It's just you know, I'm I'm in awe of them. Okay, so on that note, because we're about to go to questions, I just wanted to tell people before and queue up. Before we leave, though, we are going to hear a couple of words from Damien, if that's all right, Damien, and Ashley, and also John, because John, you've done some work with female gen gentle mm -hmm. uh, mutilation, and I, I'd really like to you, you talk just a little bit about it when we're done. So I want people here to hear that, you know, similar causes. Um, but now you've all, you know, I've talked enough and asked enough questions, and I would love anybody who would like to to ask a question of Steve. You, you know, if I can say one thing, actually, some a, a conversation that, that, that Damien and I have had a, a few times, I've also heard him speak, he's a terrific speaker, uh, which is that, uh, and I'm sure he'll tell you, that what he's, that he and his brave you know, folks are involved in a holding action and they're trying to keep, you know, elephants and, and others in, in Africa alive long enough for the, the rest of us to figure out how to keep them alive through, through the law. Uh, and uh, and I, I actually think about that, that that's why it, it just kind of adds more of, of a feeling that we're, you know, we're, we're in a rush, you know, we're, we're in a rush. Uh, but the legal system works at its own, you know, slow pace and, and it's always slower than we, well, than we would want it to be. Well, it slow pace when you're not a moneyed interest, which is frustrating. And maybe maybe we should just take one more question, really, and just ask you about if you have any thoughts on, on the developments this, this week with the Supreme Court. Do you want to say anything about that, or is it too discouraging? You to oh, oh, the oh, oh, the United, oh, the United States Supreme Court? Yes. Justice oh. Kennedy's retirement. Oh, well, I think we're in for really a long, dark night uh, of, of law over, you know, over the next, depending who goes on. Uh, 20 years, 30 years of, uh, of far-right reactionary decisions by the United States Supreme Court. Um, uh, the Non-Human Rights Project does not litigate in the federal courts, uh, and because we and don't, you're not rushing to do it now. We don't want any. We don't want any part of of, of that. And in fact, uh, there are some organizations who do litigate in the federal courts, and when they kind of dabble in rights issues, and I tell them, don't do it. Don't do it. And uh, they and we all of us regret the decisions that, that come down because they're they're you know they're ugly, and uh, so as a citizen, I know that I, I know that there's something there's something terrible coming our way. Uh, as an truly as a rights advocate for non-human animals, doesn't affect us because we never wanted to be in federal courts at all. We're going state by state, and um, to some degree, we actually model uh, our, our our causes of action and our litigation on the Somerset case from 1772. 
Uh, we really do. Um, and, uh, uh, oh, uh, I was saying something and I just forgot. Okay, well, that's a good time for questions then. So Jim, go ahead. Right. Oh, we 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 are we are coming to California, and we're going we're going to be in New York. Uh, I, but we've always had all, already, and, I'll, and then I'll get back to the first one. We've had. Uh, some hint we might get a different kind of uh, reaction. Uh, when I was teaching at Stanford Law School last year, uh, one of the Supreme Court Justices of California at, invited me to come to the California Supreme Court to talk about the work of the Non-Human Rights Project, uh, which, which I, I, I did. Um, with respect to New York, uh, I think um, uh, one of the things that Judge Fahey did, that, that was the name of the, of the single Court of Appeals judge, as he, he really chastised his brethren on the Court of Appeals and said, uh, you know, we have, to, we have to take this on. And also, that was one hint. The other hint, uh, uh, another hint he gave was the fact that, that clearly he had changed his mind between 2015 and 2018. And uh, we think that there, are, that there are other judges out there who are going, who are also, uh, will undergo the, the, the same, same sort of process uh, another thing that, that we're doing is uh, actually a big international law firm has come in to uh, give us some, some assistance on to answer the question of where should we be filing our next suit in, in, in uh, New York um, because of uh, we, we would like to know um, which of, of the judges may pay attention to what Judge Fahey said. The question is, are they going to rule against us the way they did before, or are they going to think, well, a single court of appeals judge has said that we were wrong then, and so we're we're looking into uh, which uh, court, intermediate appellate court, might be the most uh, uh, effective, uh, and, and and might listen to Ju Judge Fahey and and be able to re reconsider. Um, absolutely. And, and who is going to be uh, uh, most sensitive to, to what he's saying? Um, I, and also, you know, the, wor the world's changing. Uh, uh, m many people don't know, you know, we're, we're working with folks in illegal lawyers in India now, but in 2014, you know, since we started filing our cases, um, the Indian Supreme Court held that all non-human animals in, in India, all of them, bees, moths, elephants, have rights both under a statute and under the Indian Constitution. Uh, <laughs> the Constitution. The, the, they have, uh, yeah, you know, like bees have constitutional rights in India. So, so, so we, you know, we, you know, we, we've been to India twice in the, in the last six months working with people. We're going to be back again. Uh, as an American lawyer, I sit up and say, I know they did that, but I don't believe that for a second. Um, it's one thing to say that, the question, and what we have now have been working with uh, is, is trying to uh, bring a case on behalf of, of a detained elephant, maybe using a writ of habeas corpus in India, uh, either who's being, who's being detained in a temple or who is a so-called begging elephant, um, and arguing that they should have the common law, the right to bodily liberty that's protected by a writ of habeas corpus in, in India to begin working with, um, with the Indian judges to see how, the, how they're going to deal with it. And uh, it's amazing. Um, we probably get so far less respect in New York than almost anywhere in the world. Uh, when we were in India, we actually met with the Supreme Court Justice who had, who had written the opinion. We had like, like breakfast with him. Uh, there was another judge who, um, based on, on that, had written a decision saying that birds had a constitutional right to, to not be in cages and to fly free. Uh, and ordered them, and actually ordered some birds uh, released. And he came and had tea with us to discuss you know, why he did that, because we, we wanted to understand that. And so, and also uh, in uh, 2017 or 2016, an Argentinian court ruled that uh, Cecilia, a chimpanzee, was a non-human person 
uh, under the uh, under the Argentinian habeas corpus statute and ordered him freed from the Mendoza Zoo and sent to a uh, sanctuary in, in Brazil. Uh, there's a, uh, a case right now in front of the Colombian Supreme Court involving a bear named Chucho uh, as to whether or not he has a right uh, to, to habeas corpus. And uh, at the lower court, Chucho lost. The next court, Chucho won. The next court, Chucho lost. And now we don't know what's going on. But we do know that he's in front of the court now that two months ago ruled that the Amazon rainforest was a person in Colombia and, and, and had a right to and, and, and had certain kinds of rights. Um, New Zealand has ruled that a river is a person has rights. And that was in 2016. Last year, they ruled that the national park has rights. The, you know, both within the United States and without, there's, you know, things, things are, are changing. Um, and in, in Connecticut, we just had a judge, um, when we filed our first uh, elephant case, the judge threw us out on the grounds that our case was frivolous because no one had ever done it before. We tried to tell the judge there's a difference between being novel and being frivolous, uh, but we'll, we'll take that up with the appellate courts. But one of the really interesting things about it is it really enraged a former president of the Connecticut Bar Association who had, who had also been the lawyer in Connecticut for 10 years who had filed disciplinary actions against lawyers who had violated the canons of ethics. And one of the canons of ethics says that you can be disciplined if you file a frivolous case. And he actually wrote an affidavit on our, our behalf for the second time we filed saying this case, their case, is not frivolous in whole, in part, in any way whatsoever. And so we have people who are La Lawrence Tribe of, of, of Harvard Law School is filing affidavits for us. And we now had a, cons a, a group of 17 North American philosophers who just filed amicus briefs saying, you know, we'll leave the legal arguments to, to them. But their ph philosophical arguments, their, ph their philosophical errors are all over the place. And judge, so to the higher court saying, you got to do something about it, not just because the errors are ones of law, but because they're screwing up the philosophy as well. But who is the president of the Bar Association you're talking about? Uh, 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 Mark, his name, what his name is? Yeah, yeah. Mark Dubois. Is, I know. Is, do, you know, do you know Mark? My mother was the president of the Connecticut Bar Association. So, I'm so she, she, she knows Mark. Yeah. Uh, and so... Uh, but so, I, I want, so, I want you, so you have people quick. like him and yeah. like Professor Tribe and others coming in and saying, look, these guys are right. And I think judges are, are beginning to listen to that. In 2013, they were kind of closeted. They're, like, they're closeted. Now, like, they're like animal rights folks are coming like they're coming out of the closet and they're declaring themselves, you know, in favor of non-human animals having rights. So I want a really quick question, and then I want everyone, to, everyone who wants to ask a question to raise their hands so we have a sense of how many there are so that we can also, you know, tailor it to that. But I'm just curious, because you've been studying this more than, more than any of us have, I'm curious about what you've learned about the cognitive abilities of chimps and elephants. Is there anything that, that would really surprise us here so that we can all take that, those little statistics back with us and tell other people about it when we argue that they should have rights? Well, what, what we argue, actually, in all of our cases right now, is we're, we're beginning with non-human animals who we, can, we believe that we have the science, we're sure we have, uh, that, that, that proves that they are autonomous beings. We argue that autonomy uh, is a sufficient but not a necessary condition for rights, that if we can prove an entity is autonomous, that that should, at least, that, that should allow them to be a person with, with the capacity for rights. Uh, and so we then went out and... Uh, and uh, ha and spoke to uh, or, or brought in, um, you know, the world's greatest uh, chimpanzee cognitive scientists. They all filed affidavits. The world's greatest elephant ones, and hundreds of pages where they just show how chimpanzees are autonomous. How they they you know they, they can use language. That they're conscious. They're self-conscious. They have a theory of mind. They understand that that you know they understand what what other chimpanzees are thinking. Maybe uh, what 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 humans are. They 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 can use language. They can they have mirror self recognition. They can they can plan. They know that there was a yesterday. They understand there today, and they understand that there is a tomorrow. And they can actually plan for tomorrow. Uh, so we, we we bring these sorts of things in. I think my, my favorite elephant one is um, uh, uh, Joyce Poole, who is a terrific elephant expert. Uh, in one of her affidavits, uh, she. Uh, talked about the fact that when elephants, you know, when matri which a matriarchal society, when you have, when, when a matriarchal led group of elephants uh, come to a point, they may 
begin to disagree as to what where they should be going and she wrote they then enter into a discussion and so I, I said Joyce did you mean that they actually like discuss she said, that's what I meant and so we go, so uh, to me that means a lot so you have a group of elephants who are disagreeing who discuss what they should do next and they either all agree and go the same way or they disagree and they split up and these are the things that we think that judges and other people you know really kind of gets them and makes them understand you know who you know who they are dealing with they don't necessarily have to have cognitive abilities that are human like and we don't ask for human rights for elephants we ask for elephant rights for elephants and chimpanzee rights for chimpanzees and orca rights for orcas based upon who they are not who we are but who they are and say that they are they sh they are for certainly autonomous beings right. they can choose how to live their lives and to detain them against their will you know is a is a moral crime it ought to be a legal crime it certainly is, it ought to be the subject of habeas corpus and they need to go to a place where they can live out their elephant or orca or chimpanzee lives in in in, in the way that that their autonomy allows them to do that and uh, it's interesting not in all of the cases now for four years we've had not a single affidavit filed against us you know maybe uh maybe somebody wants to file an affidavit saying that this jane goodall doesn't have any idea what she's talking about but i don't you know i don't think that's going to happen uh and so that you know that has never happened and also even when we've lost on the law although we think incorrectly clearly incorrectly we've had many judges both from the bench and in their written opinions say wow look at look at look at who they are look at who you've proven they are however if they're going to say like the one court did but we, we positive they're wrong and judge fay he agreed that still no matter you know they 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 aren't humans uh in other words if if the chimpanzee came in and argued you know her own case in front of them they'd still say oh gee really sorry uh you, you know you, you aren't a human and what you know what we also uh point out is um you know, and we, we've been getting kind of tougher with with the judges on, on this and uh, we say um, we have been there before we have been, this is a dark place here that you're in and we've been to these dark dark places before there were millions of human beings who were slaves just because they were white well they weren't white like what did what did being white have anything to do with anything there were women who were have been abused for centuries why because they aren't males but it, it's so what they aren't males why is that why well, is that relevant I'm sorry, we just, um, did i get it wrong they are being abused, well not. they are being well we argue yeah. well i mean they they weren't persons yeah. or the or black slaves were not persons and we cite native american cases where in the 1880s there's a native american named standing bear who was uh, in his home in Nebraska and he was brought to Oklahoma where he did not want to be is where his people had never been and he came back to Kansas and he was put in jail and he filed the his lawyer filed the first writ of habeas corpus on behalf of the Native American and the US government argued that he couldn't file one because he a Native American could not be a person and there the judge did did not agree uh, there are cases in the California Supreme Court where uh, people versus Hall from from the 1854 where a, a Chinese person, uh, you know, could not testify against a white person. Uh, could, there were there were many many rights that a Chinese person didn't have. Why? Be just simply because they were Chinese. And we we say why? What's the relevance to being Chinese, to being female, to being Native American, to being white? It's nothing. It's simple. all you're doing is describing a difference. Why not say green-eyed people get rights or blonde-haired people get rights? It's the same thing. And so for you to say the non-human animal who you really understand and agree is autonomous because of the evidence we put in that's uncontradicted that you would say they couldn't have a right because of that you are now the latest installment of a whole long system of injustices and maybe it's time for you to think about what you're doing <laughs> All right, so let's let's get a. Uh, who wants to ask questions? Let's get hands up. Raise them high, just so we know, so that we can. Okay, cool. All right. Um, so you want? You would like to start? Yes. So you're here in California, and what are you planning to do here? Do you have a certification line? We are in California. Both the uh, Courtney and Lauren uh, live in California. Uh, I'm just visiting, but I'm coming back a lot soon. I, I 
I understand. Uh, uh, we are um, in the process of trying to understand uh, uh, California law. We're spending, we usually spend a year or so really trying to understand what's going on. So we're in that process. Uh, we're scoping out clients. Uh, we just spent a, an, an unlovely afternoon at the LA Zoo uh, today um, saying, uh, what about him, what about him, what about him? And, uh, uh, you know, every non-human animal we looked at was kind of worse than, than the other one. Um, uh, and we're also looking at uh, chimpanzees, we're looking at elephants, we're looking, we know where the orcas are, uh, and seeing where, you know, where might be the, the best clients, uh, where in Southern California might we also want to move forward in, uh, in, uh, with respect to uh, ordinances through, through city councils. Um, that's what um, Courtney does. She's looking at, lot, you know, at lots of uh, or multiple cities, trying to figure out where will be an, an, an entry point for us to demand that that city council uh, enact a, um, an, an ordinance that gives a certain am non-human animals rights within that city. And then another reason we picked California is that uh, we, we, we believe that we could then, if we lost there, we could, we could seek a referendum of all the people of the city. And if, and if we lost then, then we, we're already preparing our, our habeas corpus cases. We just don't know exactly who the defendant's going to be or who the non-human animal's going to be. But we're here. We're going to be in California for years. How about you? Y yay to that. Uh, we're, we do everything we can to avoid that. We make it clear to the judge that autonomy, we are arguing, is a sufficient condition. It is not a necessary condition that there are, because obviously it's not the only ground for rights since, as, as we might say to the judge, have you ever seen a child? If not, here's, here's a picture. Uh, and, and, and they're not autonomous beings, you know, if you keep going back and, and there are, you know, people with Alzheimer's, people who are, are mentally, you know, severely mentally ill, they're not autonomous, but they have rights. And why do they have rights? You know, we're not here to argue that, but we're, we're, we're saying that uh, autonomy is a sufficient condition, but it's not a necessary condition. And we never argue that, that, that it is because we don't think it is. Uh, and by the way, the reason we chose autonomy is that, as I, I may have implied, or I'm not sure if I said, is that you know we go in and we look to, we, when we go are looking at a jurisdiction, we spend all this time studying the law in that jurisdiction because we don't come in with our own ideas as to why a non-human animal should have rights. We look to see what values and principles the judges in that jurisdiction say that they believe in. And then we then uh, frame our litigation in terms of vindicating the values and principles that, that they say they believe in. So, so far in the United States, virtually every state, they, the judges say, we really believe in autonomy. And we say, that's great, so do we. Boy, do we have an autonomous you know, uh, being, being for you. In fact, if you look at the film, one of the, I stand up and, and tell the judge, and I say, you know, not, you know, there are lots, there are other beings other than human beings who are autonomous. And you have to, uh, you have to recognize that. And one, and one of the things that we try to do is to put the judges of jurisdictions into, into a corner and force them to do one of three things every single time. One is they say, we don't believe in that, in that value and principle. Well, the values and principles we choose are liberty, equality, and autonomy. And so we'd say, okay, well, what do you believe in? Because now we're going to file a lawsuit that invokes those values. Uh, <laughs> the, the second thing is they can say, and this is where we're moving towards rapidly, and Judge Fahey is al already there. Um, and uh, you know he could say well, you're right we do believe in those values and you win the third thing is they can say we do believe in those values but we're going to come up with some kind of arbitrary or and or irrational reason for you not winning like well they are they are humans we believe you know firmly that the, the judge wins that court wins today but that irrational and arbitrary reasons are inherently unstable and I guess to some degree, I'm, I'm responding also to, to Jim, Green, Jim Greenbaum, is that when judges, when you lose because of irrational and arbitrary reasons, you don't take it. You, come, you just come back and you keep forcing them to confront their irrationality and arbitrariness uh, time and again. 
And also, as opposed to the United States Supreme Court, for example, the turnover in the membership of state high courts is, is large. And so uh, in five years, there, there might be an almost complete turnover you know, in, the, in the membership there. And so uh, we're trying to, the, to uh, educate folks to maybe you know, allow them to do also what Judge Fahey said, which is say, you know, maybe I made a mistake the first time when, I'm, when, when I voted against them, and now I'm, I'm going to change my mind. Okay, so I, actually, I want to I want to make sure everyone gets gets a chance. And the, if you can keep the answer a little bit shorter, this is how we can. I can keep um, them really okay. short. I'm just going from left to right, by the way. So you're, you're next. Further educating more lawyers in how to deal with this stuff. This is the kind of question for both of you. At the level of the Although you wish you could. Well, well, if I, I've now taught in eight law schools. I've probably taught my classes, you know, more than more than fifty times. You know, I have one to two thousand of my students, you know, are are, are out there now, and, and a lot of them I see taking, you know, leadership positions or legal positions, uh, in in uh, organizations, and. Uh, and lawyers are beginning to follow what we do, and a lot of legal newspapers and legal podcasts in, interview us all, all the time. Every time a case comes down, and so we we think we're actually getting getting the word um, out there. I I felt really bad to hear that you don't they're, they're not competent. Well, I, I I didn't say they're not competent. I'm just saying they're just, no, they're I, not. They don't. It's just another case to them. Yeah, it, not, it, it, it's it's kind of an interesting way to make money. I mean, it, I, I don't feel necessarily, and when you're standing up there, it's very easy to be the judge when you're the judge. You know, um, I just I, I don't know if I feel the same sort of full throated advocacy that I would see you perform. That's all. My guess is, and I don't know what like, I'm talking. I would want you as my advocate. I don't, I, is what I'm saying, like if I was on death row, I would want you standing up there defending me. Well, Anybody if you else? do go on death row, I will you, I will do a human case. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate that. <laughs> okay. The ordinances that we're working on and, and uh, uh, say that, for example, if, you know, you know a, a chimpanzee or an elephant or an orca, if you're in San Diego, you know, will have certain kinds of rights within the boundaries of, the, of, of that city, since that's the only power uh, that, that they have. There'll be pretty short ordinances uh, that uh, basically say they, you know, they, they will have these, these kinds of, of rights. Um, you should uh, send a uh, an email, or actually, you can speak to Courtney or speak to Lauren tonight if you're interested, or send an email to it, info at nonhumanrights.org, and Can say info at nonhumanrights.org, uh, and say I'm, you know, or, or go on our website. You know, I, I want I want to help, and uh, uh, we're just I don't we're, we're just starting that, but pretty soon if we if if we've done if we've done a good job, you know, everybody in LA will understand what what we're trying to do. All right, who's next? Um, Jim, you want, did you want to have another one? Well, well, that's exactly what, what, we're, what we're doing is we're beginning. Uh, you know, we've, we've, we've brought in and now a, uh, a campaigns director Courtney and uh, raise your hand and that's what we're doing we, we have been planning to go the legislative route as well rather than running it you know jumping to states we're, we're actually trying it out first in municipalities um, because of so-called home rule issues uh, you know whether in other words does a city have the power to do something like that only 13 states we believe have that that you know have the are, are places where the cities have that California is one of them uh, and so that's why we want to, uh, you know, be, begin in California. And, and uh, Billy the Elephant certainly is one thing we're looking at. Say it again. Can my commission? Yeah, that's a good question. Well, it's probably city council more than my commission. 
What'd you say? What's he get? So the, the Department of Animal Services is responsible for all animals within the city of Los Angeles. Yeah. I think you and I are going to have to have lunch. <laughs> well, we'll... Uh, You're going to have to lobby. You have never lobbied me. Well, act actually, uh, uh, no, I haven't. Um, and, and I have my wallet that's, right that's here. That's why you were invited, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question, but I, I can tell you that... Uh, you know, we, good we, we will good lawyer? Indeed. Uh, he's already doing it. <laughs> All right, Richard, and then that, and then we're going to hear from um, Damien and John and from Ashland. Two quick questions. One is, I'm wondering what your thoughts are about the whole deal with the recent Supreme Court justice that is the microbial problem. Well, that question's already been answered, so let's hear your second yep. one. But they don't have any. <laughs> Dogs and cats don't have any rights now. No new non-human animals do in the United States. Well, they have certain kinds of protections, but they they can they can be given, they can be taken away. Uh, in fact, Donald Trump has been you know really helpful in that uh, you, because you, you you saw that uh, President Obama through executive order gave the, you know all kinds of animal protections, and Trump simply said nope. And so that's what happens when you're and uh, when you're a thing. The protections you have are at the are, are, are at the at the whim of, of us human beings. When you have a right, you have a right. Zero. <laughs> Zero. We didn't even get a vote. I, I think it'd probably be four hundred and thirty five to nothing. Including Cory Booker, um, it's for all kinds of reasons. There's not a freaking chance in the world that that that, that would happen. Um, I'm not saying 20 years from now that might be something else. Uh, in 2018, there's not a chance in the world it wouldn't get to a vote. It wouldn't have a hearing. It would simply die. And so, you know, we're not in, we're interested in being effective and actually changing the world for the non-human animals on the ground, and, and not only them. But their progeny and and the beings like them forever, um, and we're not we're just not there yet. And I, and I think part of our work is to understand as lawyers what is at least possible. What what and then try to try to gauge what the possibility is. Um, we are completely outside of the federal system now because we believe that neither the federal courts nor the nor the Congress would would pay any attention to us. And the reason is that. The, that they are, that the Congress is, is captured by anti-animal special interests, uh, you know, easily. You know, the farm people, the, uh, they, the, the, the ag people, they're, you know, they have a half a trillion dollars or, or, or more in, uh, in, in, in economic interest. And we know from what we see that, that the, uh, the ag business is beginning to take notice of what we're doing and saying, watch out, chimpanzees today, you know, cow, cows tomorrow, and so uh, it would it would be we would be squashed immediately. Uh, uh, first, we have to lay a foundation, you know, somewhere else. Where one of the things we're doing is actually modeling ourselves on the gay marriage folks, and we actually work with some of the gay gay marriage people, uh, and how they how they began, how they dealt with the, with the early lawsuits, how they went state by state, how, how they went state by state, how they dealt with. The, the, with uh, the 2002, you know, massacre when when uh, Karl Rove ended up uh, uh, in order to get people to come out to vote for George Bush, that he in 17 states he put on a con state constitutional amendments saying marriage will be a, a man and a woman, and all of them passed. And you know how how did the gay marriage people you know get back on their feet and say this is what we're going to do? And uh, uh, to, you know, so we model ourselves on on Somerset versus Stewart. We also model ourselves to an extent on both both the NAACP legal legal defense fund work uh, in the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, and on the gay marriage movement. Well, I mean, to Richard's point, though, I just want to I just want to say that you know ultimately the big advance in terms of gay marriage was the Supreme Court. You know, after 
it after, be, after it became clear that state after state right. was, was was actually okay. going to do that, and then it began moving in, in into the 14th Amendment. But I, I want to volunteer, though, Richard's skills as well as my own at the time. So you're, you're looking at state-by-state state strategy. Yes. When you are looking for, like, a committee of jurisdiction in the, in, in, in the, in the center of the House, or a good original sponsor, or even just some sort of a clever, cra cleverly crafted bill that maybe is something that at least can be aimed for, or rallied around, even just to get it introduced. I'm sure Richard will be there for you. I'll be there for you on that, it. I don't yeah. mean to discourage you. Uh, yeah. and, yeah. Well, you yeah. see, if, if, and I know he'll if, show up. If I may say, you see, the the time for them to do that will not be starting the conversation, but when we started winning all over the place at the yeah. state level, then what they're saying it's now time to start the conversation at the federal level. Uh, it, period. Yeah, I think in, in terms of the movie industry, it's going in with a package already. You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. But I know Rich will be there. So, um, well, we I I, I want to. It's starting to get a little cool and it's starting to get a little bit darker. So. I wanted to um, actually, if, if sorry, if you want to introduce yourself, but keep it down to like a minute because I think it'll bleed nice. Well, that's the wrong word, given what you're about to talk about, but it'll it'll go nicely into what Damien's going to talk about. So. Speak up a little bit if you can, because we're. And how do people go to you to learn more? They want to learn more about what you're doing. And how do we learn more? Cut exposing fgm.com. And the reason I wanted to recognize John, not just because he's in, he's, he's in here from Great Britain now where he teaches, but also because he's somebody who's been talking about this, and also as a man, talking about this relatively early on. He's been doing this for 10 years. Mm -hmm. I wanted to recognize you, and I'm grateful to have you back in the home. So, um, and now talking about female empowerment. Damien, if you wouldn't mind telling everybody a little about yourself and what you're up to. Perfect. Who better? Almost a decade later, uh, our three main streams are uh, special investigations, where we're going after independent people, uh, drug abuse survivors, training, uh, where we're developing uh, and operations. Uh, as, a, as an organisation, we've been very militarised and have gone about our, our approach to the ground uh, with a very simple understanding of what we were doing. Uh, 
See, that, that got fireworks. That was just a good thing. I got <laughs> So how many how many boxes does this check off? You know, it's like everything wonderful. And so um, there's there's an, you're having an event in Palm Springs on July 5th. So that's on this Thursday. If anyone needs information about it, they can get it from me. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna be there. Um, and how, where else can people go to find out more?
All right. Yeah. Thank you, and it's a mutual admiration society. <laughs> and what about Ashley? You're going to be our closer now. Oh, you really do. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I, uh, so I, I just wrote a documentary called Love of Bananas and Love of Sports. Um, you follow Will Bernal, who's the owner of conservation with Les Tiger, who is recognized by Bill Clinton as the hero of the whole conservation in And a week from Thursday in, in Portland at the Hollywood Theater. And a week from Thursday, <laughs> we'll be in Portland. Well, thank you. And I, and I hope every, I hope everybody's feeling that right, right now because you know they're, they're, we're are in a dark stage in human history right now. There are some really terrible things happening, and this has been a, another week on top of a lot of terrible weeks. But there are beautiful things happening, and there are beautiful people fighting for really important causes, and a lot of them are here with us at this very moment, and people unrecognized, I'm sure. I'm, I'm positive everybody here has their own story about something they're doing that's really making the world a better place. And I just want us to hold that together, feel that, you know, share it with each other, because that's how it builds and that's how it grows. You know, and thank you all for coming and nobody has to leave. You can all stay as long as you'd like. <laughs> all right. Thank you. Blessings. And accost this man. Everybody go over and talk and, and that man. And that woman. And that man. Roger, thank you so much. Thank you.